It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me, and uh, I'm very excited to be part of this conference. It's uh, great to come back to Ann Arbor after three years. Um, my paper is titled Alternative Narratives of Tropical Architecture. Existing histories locate tropical architecture as a neocolonial project that emerged in the 1950s along the networks of the diminishing British and French empires. I locate tropical architecture, which I define as climate responsive architecture, in the history of sustainable architecture. I argue that the corpus of knowledge that developed through tropical architecture in the 1950s constituted a significant body of knowledge to the discourse of sustainable architecture. Tropical architecture occupies a marginal position in modernist architectural historiography both because of its engagement with the tropics and because energy conservative design seemed redundant to European and American architects from the 1950s to the 1970s. In the 1950s and 60s, the easy availability of air conditioning and cheap abundant energy sharply decreased interest in climate responsive design and energy conservative practices. Only after the OPEC crisis, oil crisis in 1973 did energy conservation emerge as a popular environmental concern in, Ameri in the American and European architectural discourses, which resulted in the Amer establishment of the American Institute of Architects Energy Task Force in 1973 and a Committee of Energy Conservation in 1975. If we engage in the project of rewriting the history of modern architecture as an environmental history, we would write the history of the architecture in the fossil fuel age and we probably see the end of that age in my lifetime. I propose that tropical architecture embodied a vision of environmentalism based on an acute anxiety over the limits of fossil fuels. The history of sustainable architecture, which is considered a recent discourse, cannot be fully grasped unless it is understood in relationship to tropical architecture, bioclimatic architecture, countercultural architecture, appropriate technology, and post-war experiments in solar architecture. Recent histories of architecture that examine how environmental histories intersect with architectural histories include works such as Better Anchors from Bar House to Eco House. Scholars like Phyllis D. Scott and Simon Sadler, who's here, have examined how countercultural architecture can be located in modernist historiographies. My larger project is focused on tropical architecture, and I'm interested in the careers of tropical architects as the missing link between the history, histories of modern architecture in the colonies and the histories of sustainable architecture. Uh, I've identified continuities between tropical and sustainable architectural practices and examined how people trained in the tropical architecture department later reinvented themselves as uh, practitioners of sustainable architecture. I challenged the 1970s to 1990s periodization in the history of sustainable architecture. I propose that at least one of the sources of knowledge and sustainable architecture lies in tropical architecture, which developed in uh, the 1950s as, as an intercolonial movement. American and European architectural histories trace the beginning of environmental consciousness in the sphere of architecture to uh, the emergence of the energy crisis with the OPEC uh, uh, embargo. These historiographies propose a chronology of events um, beginning with the 1973 oil crisis that led to the emergence of sustainable architecture in the 1990s with uh, Agenda 21. Um, I'm looking at how climate responsive architecture developed and of course it's important to note that as we come to Agenda 21 by the Rio summit that climate is no longer a stable fixed entity that we're very much concerned with the anthropogenic uh, impact on climate itself. So climate responsive design constitutes an important phase in the development of passive technology, solar architecture, and sustainable architecture. From the early 1930s to the, to the end of 1960s, climate responsive design matured as a global phenomenon, developing as bioclimatic architecture in the United States and as tropical architecture in Asia and Africa along the networks of the British Empire. In the United States, the Hungarian born twins, Victor Olgai and Alder Olgai, produced a significant corpus of knowledge on bioclimatic design. From its inception in the 1930s through the 1950s, tropical architecture developed and circulated through a network of global conferences. In the UK, tropical architects such as Otto Konigsberger, Jane Drew, Maxwell Fry, Leo De Silla's fellow Atkinson, and 
George Atkinson were engaged in the production of knowledge on energy conservative climatic design. As energy <coughs> conservation entered the dominant discourse in Europe and America in the 1990s, appropriate technology also emerged from countercultural margins into the mainstream discourse of architecture. Concern about uh, the human environmental impact grew, ex grew exponentially in the 1980s during which the environmental discourse was dominated by industrial accidents, including the 1984 Bhopal gas disaster, the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster, and the 1989 Exxon Valdez oil spill. These accidents highlighted the magnitude of human processes and their environmental impact. And as we all know, in, the 19, in 1987, uh, the United Nations established the World Commission on uh, environment and Development, uh, which became known as the Brundtland Commission after its chair, Gro Harlem Brundtland, the Norwegian Prime Minister. The Commission's uh, report, known as Brundtland Report, introduced the term sustainability into the developmental discourse, uh, which later had, uh, which later transformed the architectural discourse, establishing sustainable architecture through Agenda 21, which was released in Rio at the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development. The key points that are prescribed in Agenda 21 for a sustainable construction industry um, are the use of indigenous materials, technologies, labor-intensive construction technologies, energy-efficient designs, recycling of materials, waste prevention, development of knowledge on the environmental impact, uh, and the, uh, development of knowledge on the environmental impact of uh, buildings and it's uh, it's interesting that many of these uh, ideas were very well developed by tropical architects in the 1950s and the 60s um, so I'm interested in how environmental consciousness manifested manifested itself into architectural discourse prior to the 1970s in the sphere of urban planning, early environmental thinkers such as Frederick Law Olmsted, Patrick Geddes, and Lewis Mumford are being re-examined in the context of environmental histories. Um, the Greek architect and planner Doxiadis and the field of acoustics attributed to him also constitute mid-20th century environmental thinking. And in the early 20th to mid-20th century India, Gandhi imagined an environmentalist utopia based on the self-sustaining village, uh, albeit which offered no solutions for urban life. So in the process of um, third world modernization, uh, tropical architects first developed and circulated ideas listed in Agenda 21. And um, I guess some of the critique that, that is leveled against uh, the Brunton Report and manifestos like Agenda 21 is also pretty valid for tropical architects, as uh, Ijlal has demonstrated. But uh, what I'm, my project is not about sort of the uncritical reception of tropical architecture or the Brunton Report, but trying to trace the intellectual genealogy of these ideas in colonial architectural cultures, uh, histories that sort of tend to be excluded from this dominant narrative. So I'll stop there in the interest of time. Thank you. <laughs>